Heroes of Reality Podcast, a podcast about the game of life and the hero's journey we all experience. Let's jump in with our host, Dylan Watkins, as he introduces today's guest. Welcome, young adventurers. Dylan here. And on today's podcast, I have Steve McCluskey. He is an alumni from the first class of the nano engineering at the University of California, San Diego. Steve's work is focused on emerging technology applied to science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, STEM. During his time at US San Diego, Steve worked directly with the founding chair of the nano engineering department, Kev. Vichigo, hopefully I'm saying that right, helping set the foundations for Nano Engineering Materials Research Center and developing thermodynamic processing methods for iron-based super elastic alloys. Sounds like something from a science fiction film. After graduating from US, uh, UCSD, he founded Nano Inc. to build virtual reality solutions for scientists and engineers working at nanoscale, specifically protein engineering and small molecular drug development. So without any further delay, I'd like to welcome my friend, Steve. Cool. Hey, what's up, Dylan? Yeah, thanks for the <laughs> intro there. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it kind of is like sci-fi, right? The, those things were super fun to play with. It was like stretchable yeah. metals and, and all sorts of things that you, you didn't think would be real. But like, literally, there's a piece of metal you could stretch like a rubber band and it stretches like th yeah, that exists. That's physics, right? Okay, so what's that? Okay, uh, that's what we have. Is that because of nano engineering? Is that is that native to us, or can you talk to me? Just okay, let's just dive right in because it, it does sound like <laughs> sci-fi, science fiction stuff. So please dive into that a little bit if you could. Um, yeah. So if uh, have you ever heard of like shape memory alloys? Like you could bend it and then heat it up, and then it'll go back to the original shape that it was uh, that it was in. They use them for like braces and glasses and like heart stents when you uh, get heart surgery to like. Yeah, they, they cool it down and they, they make it really tiny, like a Chinese finger trap. And then they, yeah. they shove it in and then it, it warms up and it expands and it, um, you know, allows you to get blood into your arteries and things like that. But nice. um, yeah, I mean, when I get into the physics, you know, it's all nano. It's like um, the atomic crystal structure like shifts. So like mm -hmm. you have it like that and then you stretch it and then they go like that. And then like, you, you know, it's like. I don't know how to explain it without like going into VR and like showing you some, some molecular <laughs> crystals, right? <laughs> well, that, let's see, this is a really good segue. I do want to open up with this just so people can understand. Um, when I describe you uh, to people randomly and behind your back when you're not paying attention, I go, I go, uh, he's one of the guys that has one of the all of the hot buzz words that actually applies real value into the company that he's actually doing. So I say you have an AR, VR multi-user blockchain uh application that actually creates real value um and and from my interpretation is understanding making designer drugs or you learn to actually do protein folds uh, can you talk to me a little bit about that because i don't want to butcher it too much but that's from my my understanding of, of what you and your company does yeah and you could throw ai in that buzzword stack as well but like sure. at the end of the day it's like there's some really complicated challenges in science and, and making it more understandable for people, uh, giving the correct attribution to the right people that have actually done the work. Um, they're helping augment them with better computational tools like you know, the AI efforts out there. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so really like our vision is, you know, how do we make the lives of every scientist in the world easier? And how do we make it easier for anyone to become a scientist? And, you know, what's going to enable that? Well, it just so happens that the latest and greatest uh, advancements in technology are, are the things that are enabling that. And those are that's the stack of buzzwords right there. <laughs> well, it's super fun to see because, I mean, when you hear the concept of allowing people to become be easier to become scientists, because, I mean, what we do need is science. I mean, they say that society is a race between utopia and disaster, and we're constantly creating our own problems and then creating our own solutions every Every time you create a ship, you create the ship wreck. And so we're constantly innovating ourselves in and out of problems. So can you talk to me a little bit about how you're using this latest and greatest technology to make it easier for to become scientists and to do more scientific stuff? Um, yeah, well, I, I think what you're talking about is like just any new technology is going to be positives and, and negatives. And, you know, that's fine. Generally, the positives outweigh the negatives. So it you know it makes sense to just, you know, keep on and advancing and um, you know, try to get that level of advancement higher. And so the way we see it is, you know, we have several million scientists, engineers, you know, people that are really pushing humanity forward, uh, you know, making better technology, better products um, that leads to better quality of life, whether it's through healthcare and new medicine um, or, you know, quality of life through new technology. You know, it's all good. But 
if we could have like a billion scientists or you know seven billion eight billion scientists i i think that's gonna be a while till we get that level but at least you know one billion scientists you know what does the world look like if we have that many people that are innovating and really pushing the envelope every day mm -hmm. uh, I, like i want to live in that world so yeah. like how do we make that happen well i think virtual reality is a, is a big step in terms of just you know making it accessible and allowing people to understand uh, a lot of the molecules and things that are typically very abstract and hard to get yeah, and that's one of the most useful things about VR is you have this embodied sense of understanding that if you try to learn something from a book, if you try to learn something from uh, someone talking to you about it, there's this there's this fundamental disconnect than actually being inside uh, a virtual application, and especially if you're working with geospatial knowledge, something that you involving, like if you have to understand the structure of an atom or uh, st structure of the molecules and how they're shaped together. Um, really using virtuality to to quickly educate and um, bring people uh, into a more fundamental understanding of what it is by moving it around the space, I think is incredible. And have you seen with your applications or with training people in VR to use this type of stuff? Have you seen um, like use cases for it? Or like, have you have you seen the education um, become quicker to learn or adopt to understanding how it gets applied? Yeah, um, so yeah, we, we build the product primarily for like, you know, real practical like science uh, projects and, and research. And a lot of that is in, you know, commercial efforts from biotech and pharmaceutical companies, um, you know, national research labs uh, in the US and, and urban abroad, um, universities that are doing, you know, similar research, you know, grad students, postdocs, uh, professors, undergrad, everyone. Uh, but you know, education, right? You know, that's about how do you create the billion scientists, right? Um, that's a huge, huge uh, goal of ours is to try to onboard people into understanding all this biochemistry. So uh, there's actually a paper uh, written by Harvard. Uh, they've been using our software in conjunction with the Oculus Quest uh, headsets mm -hmm. to teach their chemistry classes. So you know, Stanford's doing this whole like first class to do like everything in VR. It's like, well, okay, great. Like you're taking away like the lecture component, but like, yeah, these classes have been doing VR plus a little bit of lectures for quite a while. So it's like not completely new um, besides, you know, not having the lecture in 2D mode and just now having the lecture in VR. I think that's a super cool step on their end. Uh, but sorry, back to the original point. Yeah. You know, Harvard, they're doing it. They showed really, um, you know, great data from the students. Um, yeah. They said that they were able to get hands on and, and you'll understand things much more clear than they would in a textbook. Um, so yeah, I think that's is very much on point. I think it's a little bit because you're such an old school uh, VR person. I, when I say old school, I'm talking, there's been many ways of old school. We're, we're not the Sensorama 1950s old school. <laughs> we're not Lon yeah. Lawnmower Man 1980s. We're like first gen Quest or uh, Oculus DK1 old school when I say that. Yeah. And so I think because of that, when we new talk school, about old that, school. Yeah, yeah, we're the new school, old school. You know? and, and when we look at that, one of the things is, is you, you like Stanford's like, oh, we're the first to come out with this and train. You're like, you're not the first. You're well, not like the, the, yeah, they, they took away the Zoom call or whatever. You know, it's yeah. like that the rest was already in VR, but yeah, you know, now they put that into VR too. Like, yeah. great. That's that's. I think it's a positive move, and I like what they're doing there. Yeah, and I, I love it, and and I think it's I think it's very important, especially with it was really funny because with the whole thing that happened when all the the schools had to go remote. Yep. What I thought was funny is that the, they struggled. The educational facilities struggled the most with learning learning new technologies. And I thought that was the most ironic concept, but I think they actually take a bit better, especially with the, how easy like the Quest is and the new headsets. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's easier to adapt to understanding it because I think we're making it something that's more intuitive. I think the, the, the virtual interface is a more intuitive system than even a mouse is. A mouse is something that we know, but it's still a 2D plane that we're trying to use in a 3D environment if you ever try 3D modeling. Oh, so, yeah, yeah. so, um, uh, so with that being said, uh, could you just talk just a little bit? Because I, I want to segue this into one of the things that we were we were talking about in our last conversation. But can you talk to me a little bit about how the blockchain uh, works in conjunction with adding value to your system? Yeah, uh, I mean, there's a lot of push in like the metaverse right now, and mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that the metaverse is something that's already kind of you know being built. Um, obviously, it's going to keep getting better, and there's going to be assets that you take across different experiences. Um, you know, the, this whole NFT uh, situation going on right now, it's like I, I own NFTs that are 3D assets. I also own NFTs that are 
you know, 2D media like images and videos. Well, you know, I want to be able to have like, you know, my own personal virtual reality avatars that are, you know, cross platforms like that could be an NFT. So I think that there's a lot of people working on that consumer edge of NFT. Mm. Uh, what we're interested in is like the science end. So like how do people, um, you know, take their whole scientific portfolio with them between jobs? Um, you know, how do they kind of build it up in, in grad school and like have this this record of all these molecules that they made? Um, and really, it's like the ownership. It's like, you know, these you were the first one to make this molecule, timestamp it on the blockchain, give that provenance point, make an NFT with it. You know, like, I think that that's a great move and it's definitely the future. And, and that's really the future that we're moving into. It's um, your curation, creation, uh, minting of digital assets that happen to be scientific, you know, really molecules, proteins, uh, different types of you know, nanomaterials, everyone. Yeah. So what's really cool about that, what you're talking about, just so I um, don't know who's listening to this, their education, where they're at. We're talking about non-fungible tokens, NFTs, cryptocurrency. When we're talking about what we mean about that is basically just being able to claim ownership on something to say, okay, this is a in some sort of item, whether it's 2D or a 3D asset that shows that I have proof of ownership and this, I claim my stake. And so when people say, oh, well, uh, what's the difference between me doing that and me taking a photo of something? And then go and because it's a, that's a common very common thing that goes well what's the value it doesn't matter if i have digital ownership i can take a photo and it's just as good and so then we talk about the uh for example just to kind of catch people up well it's not it's like having the mona lisa you can take a photo of the mona lisa but you don't have the original and so that the difference between the two is the ownership and the creation the, the 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 important flux point of that is why would you give a damn about having ownership Right. And that's the main that's the main question. And one of the good things that you just talked on right now, which is a good reason why someone would want to have ownership is the show proof that you're a capable scientist because you're building a portfolio of work. And you're not just because how many people have lied on resumes? How many people have have made up referrals where you're calling someone's grandma and they're pretending to be a boss or whatever <laughs> it might be like, you know, yes, my son's a scientist. He's good at math, you know, like who knows? But like, but what's cool about that is you're talking about uh, that's another use case I didn't even think of, which was creating a portfolio of work and showing proof and ownership. Going, these are some of my scientific creations that have been backed by the blockchain, and so I, that's that's really neat. Is that something? Um, uh, is that something you guys came up with, or what? What caused the inspiration of actually you uh, as using that as a use case? Um, you know, I, it's just been you know building the the right technology. Like we uh, launched our blockchain platform on Ethereum like four years ago. Um, you know, the, the DAP is live. You, you could use it to hash uh, information on chain and you know timestamp it. Uh, I don't know if you know the story about Rosalind Franklin um, and, yeah. and the discovery of the the structure of DNA with uh, Crick and, and Watson. Maybe a little bit. I think it involves drugs, but I'm not sure. Please continue. Um, yeah. So, well, you, you know, like Francis Crick, right? That's kind yeah. of a household scientific name. You know, he discovered DNA. But uh, a little known fact is that Rosalind Franklin was actually in the research group and she was the one who, who did actually discover the structure you know, beforehand. Um, you know, and, and it's one of those things in academia where like the, you know, the, P, the principal investigator like takes all the credit for like the lab's work anyways. Um, but definitely one of those stories where you know, this person has little recognition in modern day society for you know her amazing work that she did. Um, and it's like, how do you bring credit to people like that? So that was, I, I think, the initial inception that, that we had on the blockchain platforms, you know, giving people credit. We even said, you know, in 2017, I'm pretty sure I'm on some podcast somewhere saying, you know, imagine a pandemic were to hit and we needed to rapidly mobilize a bunch of scientists to work together. And they were coming out with like new drugs and molecules and like hashing it on chain and showing you know, who created what when. Um, you know, so we, you know, we built the infrastructure on the platform. Um, surprisingly, when COVID hit, I think a lot of people were just down to like, you know, give their molecules to like random open source projects without any provenance to show that you were the original creator beyond, you know, just hosting in their database. So there's a lot of trust there. Um, and I think that yeah, the way that it was done was pretty decent, but you know, definitely getting ready for the next pandemic. Yeah, the next situation where we have some big bio threat uh, happening. Like, how do we rapidly mobilize people together on the you know, Web three infrastructure? So, you know, when Web three is ubiquitous, when you know, virtual augmented mixed reality is ubiquitous, um, and then the pandemic hits, it's like boom. Yeah, you know, we'll have thousands of scientists like all ready to go. Like, you know, oh hey, new structure. Let me alpha fold that. 
predict the structure, target it, go into VR with my friend from Australia, look at that, you know, make a spatial recording, you know, share that in a spatial recording is like all the, the VR movements of the avatars and the molecules on that, you know, publish that, share that with other people. Now they're able to, you know, rapidly gain information. Um, so yeah, you know, it's, it, it's really just building the science metaverse. Yeah, that's how we see where this is all going. Which is awesome, but I, I want to touch on just a couple of these uh, terms and nomenclatures that you're using, just for anybody that's trying to catch up with it, because a lot of people that are in the virtual reality space don't know as much about crypto, and a lot of people in the crypto space don't know as much about virtual reality, but primarily since it's uh, more, I'd say, virtual reality developers and people like go to this, could you talk a little bit about, you know, what is the DAO? You talk about being live on Ethereum and the DAO, and just, yeah. just so just kind of ca catch people up with that. And then you talked about alpha something, which I actually lost track when you said uh uh, alpha phase something so Sorry, but first yeah, yeah. yeah please just do this just uh just to catch people up because I, I think this is fascinating and i think it's important and i know it's it's just it's a uh, common day uh uh words for you but i think it's gonna be helpful. for sure yeah no that's a great point yeah i live in like three different worlds um yeah. so like alpha fold um that's like my biotech and ai type of world um that's a a program made by google if you know um like uh alpha go you know the, yeah. the program oh. that beat the best go so yeah. they basically took that like ai framework and applied it towards a protein folding problem so basically off a sequence of rna dna you know genetic information you could predict the physical three-dimensional protein structures that that piece of information encodes mm -hmm. um and then once you have that three-dimensional protein um you can analyze it in virtual reality and you can start targeting it to, to build drugs that would bind to it um, but you need that starting point. And, you know, it used to be all these layers of scientists that need to crystallize these protein samples and, and run super expensive experiments and then analyze the data and then rebuild the models. And, um, you know, it took forever. Um, but now, like Omicron, you know, the, the data came out of South Africa. And like the same day, pretty much, that they, they published the uh, genetic information, uh, I had my, you know, and the researchers in Australia, that's a real thing. It's a Data 61 CSIRO, it's their national research lab. Um, but yeah, like they're they're on top of it. They're using AlphaFold. They're analyzing the Omicron variants in, in virtual reality like instantly, basically. That's incredible. So then it allows them to kind of if it use AI and use the the the, the backing of, of Google to say, okay, um, uh, it, it's running different permutations and it's kind of going through the different structures and then they're they're looking at those patterns and then it allows the scientists to be able to go inside the system and be able to say okay here's some new ways and new uh, based upon uh the typical variations i mean that's what i'm looking at is all the permutations of what the uh what the how the protein can be folded based upon the structures you can then try some different variations to kind of see if you can create some novel creations i'm gonna i'm sure i'm butchering this but please <laughs> Correct yeah, me on this, I'll, this I'll, I'm just going to try to give some like bad analogies or, or something, but like imagine uh, there's a yeah. lot of art programs that you put in a string of words yeah. and they'll generate an image for you. It's okay. amazing. Um, so you could be like Bugs Bunny, right? And then it'll generate maybe Bugs Bunny for you or you say Bugs Bunny with a hat, right? So you have different pieces of info that you put into it and then you get a you know, 2D image out of it. Sure. Very similar, except for the thing you get out of it is a three-dimensional structure. Um, so you have this this model that you target. And if you say, yeah, this is going to be the Omicron variant with these pieces of data, put that in or versus the Delta, you could compare them and you could see how they might, you know, interact with antibodies in your body differently uh, or bind with ACE2 differently. Um, yeah, it. you just start doing all of your predictive analytics uh, after it. you get the structure. So then it's great. So then what you're really talking about, because in AI terms, from what I understand, I know it from more of like linguistic AI and some other things. So what you're doing is you're, you're using the, the data sets to be able to create in labels and say, okay, here's a bunch of different the things that we know about the Omicron variant or any of these things. And then and that creates a model, right? And then you can, and then you can run that in a simulation and can go, this, this is the, and in the simulation is, this is how this interacts in the body based upon the structure and you go, and then you can start making predictions, which then allows you to do some variations inside there to kind of say, okay, based upon the simulation and what we know about the Omicron or any of these other things, this is going to be how it interacts. So you can see what happens, what causes things to bind, what causes things to block and, and all those types of variables. Yeah, you, you get a much better idea. Um, like with Delta, there were um, seven, eight, nine different mutations. So like um, different points where there were changes. On Omicron, there were 38. And some of them are like buried super deep within the spike protein and they're kind of hard to tell. Um, but yeah, virtual reality, like everything is just super clear, instantly obvious. You understand what's going on. You can start uh, making hypotheses and say that, oh, 
you know, maybe these changes um, aid in the cleaving of this. And well, if it's aiding in the cleaving of this, then it might actually be more transmissible. Um, and so that's a hypothesis, you know, driven from computational predictive efforts uh, mm -hmm. that might actually impact, you know, day-to-day -day life and, and you know, how people are going to deal and, and respond to the new variants. Yeah, I almost picture like, you know, when the enemies are at the gate, because everything I always think of in like tribal terminologies, right? So then, you know, there's enemies at the gates, right? And so all of a sudden you hit the panic bell, then everybody goes to defend the gates because enemies are coming. If we think of that as a pandemic coming and everybody had an ability to defend themselves, because one of the greatest challenges that people had when these pandemics type of hit is that they only can think of, okay, um, how do I protect myself? Okay, buy as much toilet paper as I can. <laughs> just in case I need to wipe my butt 37 times. Just get a bidet, really. As, you know. as, as much, no, no, as much toilet paper. I'm going to keep wiping until I solve this problem. But it, get, it you know, gives them something to do with their time. But essentially, um, we, don't, we feel powerless, and so we don't know what to do with ourselves. But you can really empower people where everyone could have, you know, you had the Amber Alert, right? And on our phones, we get an Amber Alert that says, hey, uh, creepy kid van, here's a number, here's this, watch out for that. Then everybody knows, oh, okay, be on alert for that van. And if you almost had like an Amber Alert for these pandemics coming out, then you and you had a way to go through that. You could enable all these people to say, okay, I know how to play this game. I'm gonna put on my headset, I'm gonna, I'm gonna load up the, the nano uh, VR infrastructure, and then I'm gonna start loading in all the scientific data and I can run it through systems. Is that kind of the, the essential goal? Yeah, or, or better yet, let's look at all the potential threat vectors, uh, all the ones that could potentially emerge as a new pandemic and let's work on cures for them before they're a problem, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, that's the ultimate way that we, we could be going about it as well. I, I'd love to. I also think that humans are inherently lazy and they wait until the last possible minute, you know, like cramming yeah, for a test. For sure. yeah. We're like, oh, we don't need to worry about that pen. Now we're going to wait a second. So I think it's super cool the tech that you used and you actually use the blockchain and AI and you're talking about hashing things, which basically shows proof of ownership, right? When you're talking about hashing over the network, am I, did I got it correctly? Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And so you can you can hash and say, okay, this is when this protein fold happened. This is what's going on. And then you can say, oh, uh, you know, Bob, Bob from Australia created the system at, or created the this this protein fold. And then now we know uh, who to thank, and we can make cool Bob statues and praise Bob for all the cool for saving a bunch of lives. That's that's incredible. Um, and so let's shift gears slightly, and let's talk a little bit about. Um, uh, away from the science metaphors piece of it, but just talking about how how you see uh, cryptocurrency NFTs merging with virtual realities and the metaverse, and how those things are coming together. Um, because you've been in the space um, super deep in VR um, and in the other areas of AI and and cryptocurrency and all that space together, blockchain. Can you talk to me about what you see um, how the how they're melding together? Uh, yeah, definitely. Also, um, yeah, you asked about the. Did you want me to still explain the the DAPs and, and DAOs and, and oh, all that? Oh, on point. Yes, please carry that. Okay, away. cool, cool. Yeah. Um, so yeah, a, a DAP is a decentralized application. So it's kind of like you're using a an application, but you need to sign certain things and, and pay network transaction costs in order to hash it on chain, um, and interact with smart contracts. So there could be a DAP for trading different currencies and tokens. Um, you know, there's plenty for that. Uh, there could be a DAP for hashing your scientific work on the blockchain. That's our DAP. Uh, yeah, there's there's DAPs for pretty much anything. You're creating NFTs. That's all DAPs. Um, sometimes they're managed by DAOs, which are uh, decentralized autonomous organizations. Um, mm -hmm. Those have gotten really popular in the past year as well, with a lot of people that are just you know working with several DAOs at the same time. Each DAO has like you know a thousand people kind of doing like little tiny things that all add up. So um, yeah, it's kind of like a decentralized uh, company or nonprofit, um, but it's just it's a group of people with a common purpose that are trying to make sure it gets done. And the and the DAO is uh, the DAP is something that uses smart contracts in order to say this is how I'm going to be working on this on this um, this blockchain. Is that yeah, correct? yeah. And smart contracts just code. So instead of um, you know coding your app in, in C sharp, uh, you also code aspects of your app in Solidity. Uh, which is the smart contract language. There's a few alternatives as well, but Solidity is the popular one. And so you just have a, a section of your code base that's running in smart contracts on the Ethereum virtual machine, the EVM. Um, and then, you know, like the user interface, when you go to the website, that's just, you know, regular like code, just you know, any, any web code really. Uh, but then when you click on your MetaMask and you go to like sign a transaction, um, then you're interacting with all the smart contracts. Got it, got it, great. 
And I will say this just for uh, uh, Stephen's sake and just for us on that, just as a disclaimer, uh, this is not legal advice. This is not financial advice. This is just, we are just two dudes that, and I'm gonna say, I will personally say, I barely know anything above nothing on this topic. <laughs> so I would say, so this is just, this is just two guys talking. Just wanna get that out of the way just so we can- Yeah, I'm, I'm just, yeah, I'm, I'm a scientist, engineer, interested yeah. in tech, you know, trying to find useful applications, um, you know, to help people out. So, um, yeah, I could give a little bit more about like my journey because I've been you know, really yeah. living between the blockchain and VR space since like 2014. Rock and roll, um, dude. Yeah. You know, I heard about Bitcoin like way back in the day, I ended up you know getting into it, was pretty deep into it in like, you know, 2013, 2014. Um, but then, you know, I got the DK2. And I got the DK2 on a whim because I was, um, you know, studying nanoengineering, trying to get hands on with all these molecules. And I thought maybe, just maybe this could be like that, you know, thing I tried in 1997 um, at Six Flags, which was like this huge virtual reality headset, you know, where it really gives that three dimensionality. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sure enough, I, I got it in October and of 2014 and put it on my head and was like, oh my God, this fern plant is three dimensional on my desk. Like I could, I could see what's behind what, right? Like imagine that we're a protein or a, you know, like a quantum dot or some nanomaterial, like, you know, you get the stereo depth perception. And then it was like, well, how do I get my hands in there? And so, you know, I had the Razor Hydras and Leap Motion. And then you know, eventually we got the, the HTC Vive and all that. Um, but yeah, you know, personally, like I've been into both spaces for a long time. Um, yeah, I went super deep down the rabbit hole with the Bitcoin white paper and, you know, 2012, 13, 14, when I got into that. Um, you know, kept up with the space, you know, got into Ethereum a bit later, um, like 2016 or, or so, 2015, 2016, and thought like, hey, this is a way to, you know, have the currency and the payment system, but then you could also do so much more because you could build these smart contracts and you could build applications on top of it. Um, and, and that really, you know, got us into, well, you know, we're already doing this virtual reality molecular stuff. Uh, you know, myself, my co-founder is like, we're we're into blockchain, you know, we believe in blockchain, we know it's going to be the future. Um, you know, like what's practical, like what actually could help people. And, you know, during that whole time, um, you know, we've been talking with scientists, um, you know, some of them were been working, uh, or had previously worked with the fold it, if you know, the crowdsource folding, yep. protein folding thing. Yeah, so they haven't worked on that. And what's funny is that uh, they mentioned this while we were already working on our blockchain platform. Um, but that same group in the University of Washington that made Fold It, they wanted to make a version for crowdsource drug design, um, but they ended up not doing it because of the intellectual property concerns. You know, if they have a crowdsource tournament for folding a protein, great. You know, I folded it that way, you folded it that way. Like it's, it's the same protein, like nobody owns the way that I folded it, you mm -hmm. know? But with the, a molecule, you know, if I change that carbon into nitrogen or I add an oxygen at the end of your carbon and like, you know, make a modification, yeah, that could be the difference between a drug that works and, and you know, uh, actually kills the virus or whatever. Or maybe this is the difference between it being safe and it killing you. Um, you know, it's like each little atomic modification has a huge impact on the chemical properties. Yeah. Um, and more so, each chemical modification you make could also be a new intellectual property that you could patent. Mm -hmm. And so they had this huge um, ordeal where University of Washington was like, well, let's just own all of it. Um, but, you know, it's like, how do you get people to own their own data was really what we were going for. Um, so, you know, those scientists thought that what we were doing really made sense because you could have individual ownership and you could claim that, you know, I'm the one who created this and I have absolute proof because it's on the blockchain. Yeah, you can't argue with um, you know an immutable blockchain. It's like I timestamped it, you know, at that point in time, and it's there. It's like you can't say it's not there. You know. Yeah. What's awesome about that is so what I've noticed about this, especially in the virtual reality and these other things, is that everyone gets their mind blown by virtual reality, and then the very next step is this: okay, how do I take what I know, my own world, and then yep. shove it into VR? Right. And, <laughs> yeah. and that's what we all do. And the thing is you took you because you live in these different areas. Right. And you said, OK, well, I love I love blockchains and I understand the value of that because decentralized and a lot of scientists, a lot of developers all believe in open source as publicly available as possible, decentralized and, and, and for good reason. And what's cool is that you looked at it and said, OK, I'm into VR. 
I'm in the, I'm in the nanos. Okay. But I see a gap. The gap is there's no way to actually take ownership. And you're right because every small change is monstrous differences. Every small change could be the difference in, 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 in a dramatic effect on what it has on some system, which is both, uh, it can be amazing and terrible for the end user and also amazing and, and, and terrible for the guy who created the thing, you know, it depends on what you're creating in terms of these protein folds and and all that stuff so i thought it was great so you saw a need it was a real value it wasn't just the a gimmick right which a lot of people go okay well this is just a gimmick it goes no you're really you're creating ownership you're creating value you're providing you're, you're building structures that actually add an aid to this world which i think is awesome and which i think is incredible and so you didn't go down and your area is more in, in the areas of are you creating like like you, the smart contracts and you're talking about these hashing these things, are those turned into NFTs or are they something else? You, you know, the, this is a, it's like a 2.0 goal of ours because okay. right now uh, the way that the application stands is you hash it on chain uh -huh. and you uh -huh. have a um, like IPFS reference to show you where that asset lives in the decentralized storage. Okay. Um, and you could even encrypt it, which is, is kind of another cool aspect. Um, cause like once you publish it as an NFT, um, I feel like in encryption and, and stuff, like it gets weird because if you want it to be an NFT, it should really be the unencrypted format. But if you just want to hash it on chain, you might want to keep it encrypted and Why not do you want show it, other people. Un you want it un you want it uh, unencrypted so people can prove that you're the owner is that why um yeah i mean the, the way that we did it was let people make their own decision because like i believe in open science and I, I would prefer people to just you know create a new molecule hash it on chain to get the provenance but then release it publicly so that other people could see it and make it better mm -hmm. uh, but we did give people the option and and it's not like we could stop it anyways to um you know in keep it encrypted and so you would encrypt the data and then hash it on chain. And so people would see that there's encrypted data that's been hashed on chain. So you could always prove that you, know, you hash it on chain at that point in time, but um, you, know, you wouldn't be sharing it. Mm -hmm. And so it would remain secret. And so that could be related to patenting things or commercializing it. I got it. Um, but yeah, you know, NFTs like that is that is the next big step for our platform. It's you know letting people hash it on chain and also create an NFT to have something to show for it. Got it. And so the NFT is, so what it sounds like to me, and again, I'm, I'm going to use a uh, terminology that might make sense to my, make sense to myself and the audience is that it's almost like you're using like almost open source code on GitHub. And then what you can do is you can fork that. And if you go and create something awesome, you can either re resubmit that back to the main main branch and say, hey, this is open and publicly available. I made this cool thing with this widget. Or you can say, actually, I'm going to spin this off into my own product. I'm going to keep it private and closed so that I can monetize this and turn it into a business and do whatever I need to. Right. And so that's the benefits yeah. of encrypting versus not encrypting. But then one of the things that we're talking about here is you talked about being able to tr be able to track it and say a proof of ownership. The difference between what you're talking about versus an NFT is an, is an NFT just make it into something that is a is a tangible thing like you see a 2d graphic or a 3d model is what makes it the NFT part can you please explain to me the gap because I'm, I'm not yeah sure. so, so when people say NFT they're generally referencing the uh, ERC 721 um, so you have different smart contracts out okay. there and you could ever make an NFT with a, another protocol called a 1155. Um, but the idea is that you're just running some smart contract to create something. And the way that people manage NFTs nowadays, um, I think is very streamlined. You know, they're cross platform. Um, there's kind of like a, a framework for creating NFTs and having these NFTs um, live between multiple platforms. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say what we're already doing with allowing you to hash your info on chain and store it on IPFS and reference that is like 90% of the way there to an NFT without it being an NFT. And I think that, you know, by minting an actual NFT, something that is compatible with the rest of the ecosystem, uh, it, it would be better. And so that's really the direction we're going to be moving in. Got it. So what you're talking about is you're talking about interoperability, where you're being able to actually then save it and then share it across the network so that you can take it with you and I can have my grab yeah. bag of molecules. So and I can I can that's the science metaverse, yes, yeah, interoperability and, and grow, going cross platforms because yeah, you know, I feel like if we just have our app and you have like a yeah, user profile, great, like you kind of have some data there, and that's kind of how we're currently doing it for the most part when we work with like biotech people like that. 
Um, but yeah, yeah, I want to make that science metaverse the thing that you know goes beyond this is a single virtual reality experience and more of mm. yeah, this is your virtual reality home where you could have all this stuff and make new things. But then these assets go beyond our platform and they go into you know, Web three and live on that blockchain layer. Yeah, and and uh, just for other people to know, Web three, can you please explain that just a little bit? You know, a Web3, I feel like a lot of people are giving it a hard time because yeah. it's not too clearly defined because a lot uh -huh. of people say, you know, Web1 and we have these early days and email and AOL and then we have Web2 with you know, Facebook and YouTube and, and Google, all, all the you know, fancy jazz that we had in the 2000s and the 20 teens. Mm, and Web3 is supposed to be like the decentralized version of that. So like, you know, YouTube on the blockchain, Twitter on the blockchain. Um, <laughs> you know, Facebook on the blockchain, you, you name it. Um, just instead of letting uh, centralized companies control your data, um, you know, you're putting your data out there on the blockchain using decentralized applications. Um, and so, yeah, that's what people mean by Web3, just new internet that happens to be powered by, you know, fancier technology in the back end. Got it. So in terms of the science metaverse, because I'm, I'm going to do two things. One, I want to talk about the science metaverse, and, and then I'm going to jump back uh, to more NFTs and how people can, if they're interested in it, get up and running and all that fun stuff. But what I want to talk about is the science metaverse. What do you want to see for the science metaverse? What are some pieces missing? If you were like going to shout out into the uh, internet sphere, what are some elements that you would love to see gaps filled for the science metaverse so that you can you can really be a part of this ecosystem? Uh, yeah, I think there's a lot more things that we could do with community. Um, you know, we have a you know pretty diehard group of early adopters that have been you know, waiting for this for 30 years since the lawnmower man days, and yeah, they they wanted to have virtual reality molecules, and they spent millions of dollars on a cave system in you know 2002 to try to make it happen, but it never really worked the way that they wanted it to work. And I think part of that was the hardware not being there, part of that was the software not being there. Um, but now we're here and they love us and they're they're screaming out at the top of their lungs like hey everyone like try nanom go download it it's on app lab uh, if you have a quest you know like download it today um you know join the slack user group you know but i think that that's very very early stages of community and so when we talk about scientific metaverse um you know it's about bringing the world of science together into you know virtual worlds having activities having group um, you know, sort of jam, science jams in VR, where you could all get together and, you know, share info, you know, meeting people, um, connecting students with, you know, professionals and sort of, you know, bridging that gap about, you know, how to take your knowledge into practical industry applications, you know, connecting people to form a DAO. Like, I haven't seen any biotech DAOs, you know, where's the DAO to cure cancer or, you know, cure some other disease? Like, yeah, I'm seeing a DAO. I, I, I was part of the DAO to buy the Constitution. Unfortunately, we didn't win. But um, yeah, I thought that was a cool concept, right? You form a DAO, everyone puts together money, and then they, they bid on a copy of the US Constitution at a Sotheby's auction. Like, that was cool. It happened. <laughs> um, I, but I, where, where is that for biotech? And <laughs> where's that for diseases, right? <laughs> So it's beautiful. Uh, I wasn't familiar with the Constitution bit. So I don't I know. Can you tell me just a little bit more about that and expand upon that? Yeah, yeah. OK, so I see this on Twitter uh -huh. and it's like we're going to buy the U.S. Constitution and they post some memes of um, a guy like Nick Cage from uh, a National Treasure, which uh -huh. I think that they were actually trying to steal the Declaration of Independence or something. Um, but yeah, the, the idea is similar, right? You have historical U.S. document. So I think that there were 11 or 12 copies of the original U.S. Constitution signed by all the founding fathers and all that. And uh, the last one that went up to auction was in maybe the 70s or something like that. It's been a while. So periodically, these will go uh, you know, from a private collection into an auction. And so a bunch of crypto people saw like, hey, you know, this thing might go for like 10 mil, 20 mil. Like, you know, what if we got some capital together and we were able to bid on it? And uh, the unfortunate, well, so the fortunate part is that they kept breaking their gold. You know, they hit the 10 mil, the 20 mil, the 30 mil, the 40 mil. Um, you know, they got a bunch of crypto to try to bid on it and they got in the auction and they had many successful bids and it was looking like they were winning. Um, but then um, oddly enough, if you remember the whole GameStop situation, yeah. uh, one of the big like hedge fund guys that was short on GameStop ended up outbidding the Dow by a, a marginal amount of money because everything in the Dow was open, right? So you kind of know that their maximum bid is going to be 42 million or whatever it was. Uh... And so this guy bids like, I don't know, a little bit over what the maximum bid could have been. 
And it's like, oh man, like he's, we he's were the so one, close. It could have been the people. Could have been the people owning the Constitution. He's the one dollar guy from Price is Right. You know what I'm saying? He's the one dude that puts him puts yeah, one dollar in exactly. and everybody else goes up. Oh, that's so rude. Of course. Yeah, very rude. But um, yeah, um, I I think conceptually though it's pretty cool and like you see cool. the community mobilize and um, it was so close. You know, if, if that guy didn't exist, then you know we would have won. Well, uh, you know, it, depending on, on if he's still holding that short, uh, he might not exist after a while, you know. Um, true that. Yeah, <laughs> true. I, I, I have some GameStop stock. I'm, I'm, you know, apes strong together. That was one of those moments that like the it was one of those moments that the, the it, common it, you people on computer share. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The copy share stuff. Yeah, I own you, you, well, you direct I, registered. You, you, I, I, if, you, if, you, if you own GameStop, you got to DRS your shares. OK, I haven't DRS. I have friends have done it. I haven't gotten around to it because I know how much of a hassle it is. Dude, it's, it's not a hassle. You it's call it Fidelity and you uh -huh. say, uh, well, it, it depends where you have them, right? If yeah. you have them in like an IRA or 401k, or yeah. whatever, apparently there's an issue. Yeah. But if you have them with a regular broker, um, yeah. you could just, yeah, you could DRS them. It's super easy. Really? Just give them a call and you tell them. Hey, I would like to transfer my share as a computer share. And then oh. like they they do it all and then you just get something in the mail like a few weeks later. I'm gonna go do that. Thank you for that that info yeah. tip. I, I was told from my friend who's got he's like, You gotta you gotta do that, uh, uh the copy share thing. I was like, he's like, But you gotta do this, it's a big hassle, blah 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 blah. I was like, ah, too much effort. But now that you tell me I can call I can call my uh uh my my local people, I'll make that call and I'll fix yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I mean apparently like Fidelity was the the easy one for a while. Um yeah. I know eToro is giving people a lot of issues apparently and not letting people um transfer their shares off, which um is a little bit weird, right? Because you're supposed to like if you know if I own my Ethereum um and it's in my wallet, I could do whatever I want with it. There's nobody else controlling it. And if Coinbase is holding my Ethereum for me and I ask Coinbase to give it to me, they will transfer it directly in my wallet. Yeah. Um, but this goes into the whole like centralized exchanges. You know, they'll give you an IOU receipt and they won't give you the actual asset. Um, and I think that that's kind of the, the center of this GameStop situation. It's like, well, you know, do we actually own the things that you tell us we're supposed to own? Um, or are we just, you know, holding IOUs that say that you should give us to us at some point in time? Yeah. Um, and th that's really the, the issue with the brokers, um, you know, transferring it is, you know, like you're saying, I want my asset and they're saying, how about an IOU instead? That makes sense. Yeah, because there's because uh, supposedly it, the GameStop has a thing where they've actually there's more shares in the market than actually exist. And so that's when the, that's why we want to go to CompuShare uh, because of the that whole issue. So. I did not know I could call, so I will be calling them to figure that out. Uh, yeah, yeah. Are, are you on Fidelity or is it different? Yeah, I'm on Fidelity. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's just yeah. called Fidelity. Yeah, it should be st yeah. straightforward. Okay. Yeah, I'll call them for sure. That's so cool. Thank you for that. Um, shifting back, I want to I want to bring it back uh, to the scientific metaverse, right? You said yes. you need you need more community. You need more engagement from the community. What else besides the diehards, right? Because that's why I think that's kind of what segued us. Uh, what else are you looking for a part of this scientific metaverse that you think would really be that crossing from early majority er, uh, early adopters to the you know early majority what's what's that things need to happen across that chasm mm, interesting yeah I mean we're kind of in that transition right now um you know with meta sort of uh, you know commercializing the metaverse and you know getting more people into virtual reality with their oculus uh, their quest platform. Um, yeah, I think that that's great for getting more people involved um, because when you get a scientist a VR headset, you know, they download Beat Saber, they say, wow, virtual reality is amazing. I wonder if we could actually do that protein stuff I've always wanted. And then they you know, inevitably be, like find us. And so I think a little bit of a bridging that gap just to you know, get the people that would want to use our product um, you know, knowledgeable and, and actually you know, onboarded. Um, but I think beyond that, it's also you know, how do we get regular people to you know learn some science? Like you know, people take Coursera courses, learn a little bit more. Um, you know, look, looking at a, a lesson in virtual reality is just amazing because you have people talking and, and showing you molecules in 3D. You could pause it, you could you know grab it and look at it yourself and and do whatever you want. Um, and really getting hands on, I think that's where all the learning occurs. And so, um, yeah, definitely just getting more people centered around it and, and more engaged at the, the scientific level, at, you know, novice level, um, you yeah, know, really at all levels. That's, that's cool. I mean, it's almost like when I think of 
people being aware of VR and getting into space, I, I think of it as lights being turned on as the city gets dark. And if you look at it from the system, some people turn on their lights at like 3 p.m right? Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of the early adopters, right? And as you're going through it, it there, there comes a point where it becomes this, this threshold where all of a sudden all the lights turn on and all of a sudden everyone's aware of VR and then everyone's diving into it with both feet. And then there's going to be this mass adoption thing where, where out of nowhere, um, everyone goes on. And right now, because, you know, for 300 bucks on Amazon, you can order yep. a headset and have it shipped to your house in 24 hours. That's pretty low friction versus me and you in the good old days. We're like, okay, oh, we yeah. Need you need a two thousand dollar PC. You need to go mount these things in these corners. You need to go plug this thing in, and don't worry about it. you have to download the firmware, blah 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 blah. And so, um, it's definitely getting better and quicker and faster. So you're just saying it just takes a little bit more time and a little bit more awareness by the scientific population that VR is a thing, and then they they'll jump onto your your system and then boom from yeah. there. Well, in awareness to, to regular you know, VR gamers and stuff, they're like, hey, you know, if they wanted to learn science like the other beat cyber machine is the perfect vehicle for learning science um and so you're getting them into it like yeah, how, how do you bridge that gap right like i would love to see some you know savant uh or prodigy type yeah. of you know kids that are in vr um that just get hooked on a nano and they're like oh my god like i'm making my own molecules and you got the 13 year old that you know solved coronavirus or, or cancer or heart disease or you know, so xyz funny, diseases <laughs> I love it. You you called the VR headset their Beat Saber machine, yeah. uh, and which is true. A lot of people that is the main use case. I mean, it's 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 better than calling it the porn machine. You know, it's better it's better than that. But it, but really, the Beat Saber is the um, I call it the Pokemon Go of VR. Mm, yeah. it's like everyone got into it. Everybody knows it. Everybody loves it, and they get up and running. But you're right. I would. It would be so cool if they had it for you, like your system. If you could teach kids to fall in love with it, like kids fell in love with Legos. Right. Yeah. And you're talking about they get obsessed with that. So they all of a sudden they fall in love with being able to do this and actually see that you can actually have a scientific output where Timmy, nine years old, invents a, a, a you know, a cancer curing drug by doing protein folding in his off time while he's just playing around with his friends in this VR environment. That's a mm -hmm. is there is there like a for you, like a holy grail kind of thing that you're going for with, with making this whole system and stuff? Is, is it the scientific metaverse or what for you? is that real sense of purpose or meaning and drive that keeps you pushing hard? Yeah, um, real atomic physics from the, the nanoscale up, you know, like getting hands on with simulated molecules and you're know, bringing people together. Like I, I see that as like scientific metaverse from the atom up. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, if you look at it in that frame, you know, it's like nano engineering, right? I did nano engineering at UCSD and we looked at everything below hundred nanometers. So, and, and that's about the size of the coronavirus. So you look at the coronavirus is a hundred, you know, you go down and smaller and smaller, you get to like proteins and atoms, um, you know, really being the, the things that you interact with. And so, you know, what I want is you know, everyone to feel like Iron Man when they go into VR, pull up the periodic table, you know, call up Jarvis, be like, yo Jarvis, uh, could you come up with some better drugs for me? And then boom, you know, you get that AI output and then you get some generative molecules in there and then you're with your colleague or your friend, let's say. And you're just like, huh, like, what do you think about these? Like, maybe if we added, you know, this group there, we could actually make it a bit better. Um, you know, you could send that back out to the algorithms and you sort of get this, uh, you know, feedback cycle there. Um, but the idea is just, you know, connecting people, making things more efficient, helping them gain breakthrough insights to, like, greatly speed up their research. Like, if you were... You know, trying to, uh, I don't know, hit a nail with the rock and, and, you know, it just really wasn't working. And then one day you thought, oh, man, if I just like made a hammer, like I could probably do this way more effective every time I try to do it. And then somebody makes a hammer and then they bring the hammer to the party. And then, you know, it's like there's all these tools that you can keep adding into the ecosystem. And the more people that join the party, um, the better tools we're going to have, uh, the more shared they're going to be. Um, you know, people could ever and you know, share computational resources at some point. I think that's kind of down the road because right now uh, Amazon Web Services and just like general compute infrastructure kind of works. Um, yeah. But yeah, you know, like I, I want that kid to just go in, feel like Tony Stark or that, you know, retired professor to go and feel like Tony Stark. Like we all want to be superheroes, you know? Well, and that's the thing with technology. It really enables us to be superheroes. I mean, especially with VR, you can be anyone, anywhere, any place, yeah. anytime, and then you have all those superpower abilities. Especially when we get in the whole narrow link, hook into your brain, all that jazz. 
Uh, it's going to get really weird really quickly. Uh, when you talked about making your own, hey, Jarvis, make me some designer drugs, um, what I thought was really interesting about that, I'm, I'm sure there's going to be a point uh, where it's both where you can have um, custom designer drugs based upon your own DNA mm -hmm. and you can do things where you can like say, okay, this is, this is my DNA and this is what's going to affect me best. And then you'll be able to actually yep. work on, on folding your own um, proteins and designer drugs. Can you talk to me about like, yeah. how far out do you think something like that looks like? Um, if you asked me like a couple of years ago, I'd say pretty, you know, far like 10 years or something, but um, you know, you're asking me today. So things yeah. are a bit different. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's it's available now. Like you could use AlphaFold. So I, if I sequence my entire genome, I could actually predict the 100,000 or so protein structures that make up my body. Um, you know, 100,000 different types of proteins. Obviously, there's you know billions upon billions of copies of each one of those uh, to make you know me into me. Um, but if you could get that data set that says you know this is Steve's proteome, you know all the 100,000 structures that are unique to him. And then start using that as a way to simulate different chemical interactions. Um, you could probably screen out a lot of drugs that you know, might have adverse side effects or might be ineffective for you. Um, so, I, like, we're kind of there already today, and I think it's a matter of you know making this uh, just ubiquitous. Like, you know, can't everybody go on Twenty Three and Me, or you know, they don't do the full genomic sequence, but other areas where you just do a full genomic sequence predict your proteome. Anytime you go to the doctor, the doctor is like, well, I can prescribe you one of these four drugs and I'm not sure which one. It like, how do you choose which one? Well, this is this is the way to choose which one and get a better idea. That is so cool. So you're telling me that I can, in, in theory, uh, sequence my whole genome and I could make my own proteome, which sounds like uh, I, I, don't, I don't fully understand that, but then I can take, I can use the alpha system um to be able to actually run these designer the, the, these drugs for the system see are there any adverse reactions is there any effects that happens to the to, to the sequence is that correct um yeah. almost yeah because you would have correct, the genetic correct, info correct. Yeah, yeah use use alpha fold to predict the proteins yeah. once you have the protein structure then you would use yeah. a different program like molecular docking programs like autodox mina is one of them um but you could use docking for instance to try to then predict um, what the chemical interactions would be with all of your proteins. That's awesome. Yeah. That's so cool. Nobody does that. Nobody mm -hmm. does that. Like this, mm -hmm. we're, we're super new. And I think part of that is like, you know, who is trying to build out a library of, you know, custom proteins and assets and allow you to have indi individual ownership, right? This also goes into NFTs because of course, you know, when I own my, my proteome, I want to own my proteome as NFTs. Um, in my personal collection. Yeah. And so you know, if everyone has individual ownership of their proteins and they're able to you know, simulate um, you know, their library of proteins and all that, um, yeah, I, I just think these things are going to be ubiquitous at some point. And it's a matter of you know, who's going to actually do it. And yeah. for right now, it looks like us. You know, we seem to be the, the ones that really care about making it happen. That's awesome, man. You do, and, and you had the I mean, you had the foundational pieces. I mean, you started with the right building blocks, right? You came in with the the background and the fascination of blockchain in the beginning, nano at the beginning, VR at the beginning, and you have assembled and structured the, this to actually, you know, be the guys that are at the forefront of this technology, which is so cool. If slightly shifting gears here, but if For sure. if you if you're recommending people. Uh, let's say developers to get into the space, right? When and we had some conversations about this before, um, not necessarily into the scientific space, but let's just say they wanted the VR developers that wanted to get into the crypto space elements, right? And from my understanding is that you have a couple of paths. You could try to make your own cryptocurrency and you could try to do that from the ground up and then do all that stuff, which uh, could be exp expensive and dangerous and, and hard because you're having issues with ownership and money and and there's and there's money and there's regulations around that that's one path which is more difficult but could be could be more lucrative um and there's the other path of making nfts with making artwork with making the ability to say hey in my game in my experience in my own micro metaverse experience that i want to i want to stitch onto everybody else's system i can make nfts and have them shareable of the network um these are some things that we've talked about what recommendations would you give to people um that are uh maybe looking to get into the space um that are trying to figure out how do i get started where do i go yeah i'd say like play around with uh, other platforms out there first um you know mint some nfts and, and you know just kind of get your feet wet on the 
blockchain space and maybe even join a DAO. You know, uh, sign up for a DAO that you like, join their Discord, see how you could help out. Um, you know, find some friends in there that could kind of like field all of your questions. Um, but definitely, like, there's people that never got into Bitcoin because they just, you know, didn't believe in it and they, you know, had a trouble understanding it, but they didn't put down like 20 bucks into Bitcoin or something. And so I, I feel like there's a psychological element that happens, like, once you actually like get into it and you're, you know, you're owning Ethereum, you're like, you bought an NFT that you thought was cool. Um, you know, you're on Discord, like talking with people that are super deep into crypto and, and think this is the inevitable future. Um, I think that you're going to learn a lot more in that environment. And then I think that'll give you a baseline understanding of what you might want to do in terms of your own project. Um, mm. and, and, and like you said, though, like NFTs probably is a better way to go than making your own token. Um, you know, making your own blockchain and token nowadays. Um, yeah, I, I just feel like it doesn't make as much sense as, um, you know, as it did in the past, mm -hmm. um, because it, there are, you know, things like Ethereum that just kind of work and yeah, you could have your own tokenized platform and you know, really NFTs and tokens do go together where if you have a video game and you have, you have points, badges, leaderboards, um, you know, you could try to, you know, tokenize your points and then you could NFT your badges, um, and you could show that on a leaderboard, you know, it's like all those elements are fine and if you get a community that's into it like um yeah I, I think that you know empowering your users to do something cool is what you should be looking at this as that right there i think is the heart of the matter what i think is a real value what you're talking about there is empowering your users to do something cool and so much in whether it's virtual reality whether it's video games whether it's ai whether it's crypto whether it's you name the thing that you're getting into Ultimately, if you're making an application, if you're, if you're building something, if you can help your users feel awesome, if you can help them feel, if you can help them feel cool, if they can feel like superheroes, if they can feel like they have extra superpowers, that right there is the key to success, like hands down. And I think you touched on something that's incredibly powerful right there versus just like, I'm going to get into it and I'm going to get into space. When you say uh, uh, points, badges, and uh, you know levels, that kind of things, it's one of the things that one of my designer mentors just goes nuts with. She yeah. absolutely hates it because it's like, it's like the... <laughs> The basic level when people don't know anything about gamification, yep. they're like, you know, yeah. this needs points. Level well, that's back. like the first thing you learn. And like, yeah. I, I took this Coursera gamification thing like five, six years ago or something. And like, it's like, that's it's the main thing. It's not all of it, but it is like, you know, the main, just easy, simplified gamification. <laughs> It's the broad strokes. It never creates anything yeah. sticky because you 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 leave this huge gap on the table of helping your users feel awesome, you know, and that yep. that creating value of the system, which is yeah. which I think well, and incredible. connected, right? Um, there's a lot of NFT communities out there. Um, Board Ape Yacht Club. I'm not a Board Ape Yacht Club owner, but I think it's very fascinating that they were able to you know get a bunch of people together that um, you know all are sharing their profile photos. Um, you know, their NFTs are their profile photos. You could see, you could see the community from an external uh -huh. lens, and so that community building aspect, Ivern, um, I think NFTs play a very important role in that. I'm not familiar with that. Could you let me know about that a little bit? The board. Oh yeah, isn't that like Post Malone and like a bunch of other people? Like if you look at their Twitter profiles, yeah, they paid like tens of thousands of dollars for these um, uh, NFTs of of apes. And, oh um, yeah originally the nfts of apes they were um you know, relatively cheap and you know mm -hmm. crypto people got into it but now it's like mainstream almost like a piece of uh jewelry you know because people know you paid 50 grand for it and it's a status symbol or status whatever but yeah that that's i i think that's just like one example i, I thought you would know it because it's the most prominent one but there's a ton of like lesser known um you know community oriented nft projects where everyone has mm -hmm. their own um, you know, unique image, they use that as their profile pic and you know, they chat with each other. Um, it's kind of like, are, are you in the in crowd? Like, do you own one or do you not own one? Because yeah. if you don't own one, you know, cool. Like maybe you could get into it, like we could chat. But then if you own one, it's like, oh my God, we're best buddies. Like I own one too. You know, it's like you're, you're in it. Yeah. And one of the things like I'm, I'm ramping up as a primarily diehard VR, uh, very deep, got into AI for a while, IOTs, all that kind of stuff. So that's my area. I'm um, recently got Coinbase. I got a bunch of different uh, cryptos and a bunch of different ones. And you're right. There is a thing on the outside. And I think here's what happens. There's, there's VR people. And I'm going to speak to this mm -hmm. as the VR side where we 
love virtual reality because it's amazing. You put it on, you feel the inherent value of the system. You know it's amazing. You know the power of it transported. It blows your mind. And you're like, this is valuable. And so you want to share that. Um, but if you don't buy crypto, you're not, um, if you see it and you see these things go up, it feels kind of like a pyramid scheme. It feels a little culty. It feels <laughs> like, like that. But that's the things you feel. Right. And then, but then once you get on the inside, your opinion shifts because once I got into Coinbase and once I got the cryptos and once I could see the things going up and down and I could very, very easily throw money into it and watch it go up and down, I like, I felt the game and I felt the bug and I felt the need to like wake up and like look at my, did it go up? Do I go no? I get those notifications. <laughs> I was like, I was like, oh, I was like, this is the game. Okay. I feel it. I'm good. Okay. I, I know what this, I know what this is like. So there's a way different sensation on people that, that don't have NFTs or cryptos or a part of a DAO or any of that stuff that you don't have the same kind of knowledge than if you would, if you're actually inside playing the game. And so that's, I think that's a really important point. And I think when we talked last, you're like, maybe you should get some crypto. Um, so you got some crypto now. Nice. I do. I yep. got some crypto. No, no NFTs yet. No NFTs. Um, that's next. That's next. Yeah. What would you, let me ask you a question for an absolute noob. Where do you think is the best way, best places for me to get some NFTs? I feel like my grandma going, what about them internets? Like, what do yeah. you think? Yeah. I mean, OpenSea.io is, is popular. Uh, Foundation.app. Um, I use that one too. I think that's cool. Um, a lot of sites will just kind of like spin up their own website and allow you to mint it there. Like um, Ashton Kutcher and Mila Kunis, they did Stoner Cats. Okay. Um, and so for that, you actually just minted on the website, but then you could you could see the stoner cats on OpenSea. Uh, so OpenSea is kind of one of those um, platforms that is just for general NFTs from anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, but you could do auctions, and oddly enough, my friend uh, told me about this like open Minecraft world, you know, because everyone's in like metaverse and like virtual worlds plus blockchain and. I was like, oh, like, sure. Like I'll buy this little, I don't know, thousand by thousand grid of Minecraft uh, oh. or whatever um, you know thing it is because it sounds cool. Um, and then I looked at my OpenSea and it's like, you know, I bought it for X and then people are, you know, sending me bids of like, you know, two to three X what I paid for it, like asking <laughs> if they could buy it. And I'm just like, I, I bought this cause I liked it. Like I'm not, I'm not trying to flip it and like sell it for a profit or anything. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I just got diamond hands. I don't really sell things typically. I just hodl forever. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Buy things you like. Um, yeah. you know, if, if you're in it for money, like I can't really give you much advice there. Uh, if you're in it for fun, like, yeah, just buy the things you like. I'm in it just to understand and to feel it. Right. And that's why I got yeah. into, it. I wasn't into like, Oh, I'm going to try to like do it. And I have some of my friends that are day traders and they told me about Coinbase pro and stuff like that. But uh -huh. I want to know what is the, what is it? And I, I try to go from me just poo pooing it because I'm a VR developer and I go, Oh, that's just, ah, so I want to get in it. And then when I got into it and I could feel the bug and I was like, Oh God, okay. Okay. Yeah. This is what the feeling is. Okay. Okay. And so learning to get more into this, learning to get more into the space, I think it's incredibly, incredibly valuable because then it's very, it's very difficult to know something from the outside in, but once you're into something and you're actually yeah. a part, because when you talk, you're talking about this with some great advice is be a part of a community, find people in the space, join a discord, ask questions, like get, let me give one caveat, never yeah. send your 12 word seed phrase to anyone that DMs you on any social media platform. That is your private keys. Never send that to anyone. Yeah. Sorry, because I'm all like encouraging. Yeah, just go on Discord and go talk with people. No, there will be people that try to scam you and rip you off. Yeah. Like, be careful about that. Um, but for the most part, there are a lot of friendly people. Yeah, so be aware there are scammers. Well, any place there's value, there's going to be people trying to scam the value. That is just part of it. I mean, just you could look at uh, mail, right? Look at the, you know, yeah. you, your, your car's warranty's expired. Please call this number, <laughs> you know? So yeah. that's that's a part of it. And, but but just to get in, to feel it, to understand it and to know it from the inside yeah. out, join a community, don't give away your private keys, just like the same way you want to give away your, 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 your banking routing information and all that stuff. Um, it's, it's important. So, um, I think this is fantastic. Uh, you know, uh, with that being said, like, let's just say, uh, is there, is there anything else, um, you'd like to let people know about, about what you're doing, about the things you're getting involved in, um, before you tell them how they can get a hold of you? Um, yeah, I mean, like try Nano. Yeah, you know, it's, it's also one of those things where, you know, just if you have a VR headset, um, you know, we're on App Lab, uh, search N-A-N-O-M-E. Uh, that'll allow you to, you know, see our app, download it. Um, it's free, just got to make an account. There is a bunch of tutorials as well, where you can like 
you know, actually see avatars of scientists like teaching you science, um, as well as teaching you how to use the platform. So it's like tutorial plus um, you know scientific lessons in there. Um, but yeah, yeah, you know, just get started. Like you know, it's um, there's a world like before you try it out, and then there's there's a world after you try it out. And hopefully that world after you try it out, you're more comfortable with like DNA and proteins and molecules and you just have a general idea of you know what the makeup of reality is from the atom up. That's incredible, yeah. Expand your horizons into a new reality. Uh, join the web 3.0 craze. Um, I'm trying to get as many buzzes things as I can in this final sentence, but no, but really, <laughs> it's but it's really it's 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 powerful because yeah, you're you're literally expanding your reality by trying this new technology, and and you are going inwards uh, into this microcosm version. I think it's incredible. So, uh, Steve, it's, it's so awesome. Uh, with that being said, uh, if people want to get a hold of you or reach out to you or or send your company a message, what would that what would that look like? for them to reach out? Um, yeah, you can visit our website, nanome.ai. Um, yeah, if you shoot an email to hello at nanome.ai, um, yeah, we're pretty responsive on that. Um, you know, let us know your questions. If you're scientist, educator, hobbyist, interested in molecules, you know, whatever it may be, um, you know, happy to chat with you. And uh, yeah, see you in the scientific metaverse. Uh, I think that's yeah, really, really what it's all about, right? Bringing people together. Absolutely, man. Community is everything, brother. Thank you so much, Steve. I really appreciate being on the show. Uh, I appreciate your time, my friend, and I will see you on the other side. Cool. Thanks, Don. Thanks, Steve. Catch you, brother. Peace. Thank you for listening to the Heroes of Reality podcast. Check out heroesofreality.com for more episodes. While you're there, you can also take the Heroes quiz to find out what kind of hero you are. Or if you have a great story and want to be on the podcast, Tell us why your hero's journey will inspire others. Thank you for listening.